So we are gathered here today to hear Mar Bartlett speak about the memoir of her late husband, Barty Bartlett. In his memoir, he chronicles his experience as a traffic accident investigator and longtime sheriff deputy in Maryland and his work within Silver City. So a lot of you probably knew him. Uh, deputy First Class Barty Bart Bartlett was a truth teller, protector, skilled officer, devoted family man, and a ghost whisperer. A veteran member, member of the Frederick County Sheriff's Office, DFC, Bartlett served in law enforcement for 25 years as part of their traffic unit. During that time, his focus was on accident investigation and reconstruction. He was later appointed head collision reconstructionist for his department. In his memoir, Deputy of Death, DFC Bartlett recounts tales from his career looking for the truth behind traffic accidents hidden in the twisted remains. Some of his tales will catch you off guard, some will make you laugh, and others will make your heart sink. But all of these stories tell of how DFC Bartlett became Deputy Death. So with your applause, welcome his wife, Mark. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here. And thank you everyone in TV land and in Zoom land. And for our librarian here that isn't here today, which is lovely Lillian, the librarian. And she's done an awful lot of the background things to talk to different departments in the law enforcement in Silver and the people like the background people, fire departments and all the rescue team people. And if they couldn't make it because they were 24 seven, they'll be able to watch this at a future date because Silver City's library had some kind of connection on YouTube and they can put their wonderful events of any of the events the library has in the next couple of weeks. So, 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 so happy to be here. This book has been a long way coming. It took 24, 25 years for my husband to live through these stories. And I'll start one at a time with the shortest little vignettes that hopefully won't jagger your brain too much. And then we'll go on to other stories, some that I'll read and some that I'll just have to tell you straight out because I start talking so fast, I wouldn't be able to keep up with it if I didn't try to read it, okay? So, Deputy Death. The first story I'm gonna have to start is how he got into his academy. And he was in his mid early twenties in upstate New York. And the story is going to be called, uh, the nickname story is called Mr. No Neck. And that is the gentleman that is going to be leading us through this story. So all the guys are dressed up in their workout stuff and they're new recruits and they're all excited and the room is stuffed. The room was very warm when we started to line up for exercises. The door opened up and in walked Mason, no neck. Our physical instructor, I thought I was gonna have a heart attack. He looked like a retired Marine drill instructor. No neck was hardcore. No hair on his head, and no hair down his neck because he had no neck. <laughs> but he did have a broken nose. He told the class that we're going to do the exercises his way. Does that surprise you? The predatory commands, getting into position, then commands, doing the exercise. And then one of us had to lead, lead the different exercises. If any of us persons did not get the order in right order or say it exactly the right way with the exact right position, then everyone was given a command to stay still until it was corrected. Nonak had assistants also doing the instructions. Push-ups were first. With the person screwing up the second command as soon as we started, we were all doing the push-ups and we were exhausted already. After three minutes of staying in the same position, in a push-up position, we heard people whimpering and being in that position was exhausting. 
No neck finally got it right to say, okay, fine, go on to the push-ups, the four count push-ups. And, you know, all I could think of is good thing I worked in a meat factory. I'm in good shape. Didn't bother me. That was Barty's expression. So now comes the jumping jacks. With the same routine, the commands, and no neck wanting 24 count jumping jacks, yes, the room was freaking hot. <laughs> and half the way through, the people were getting sick and fainting. The guy behind me lost his lunch. And no neck just told him, take off your sweatshirt. And then he made the dude wipe up his throw up on the, t on the sweatshirt. Then he told the others who threw up to do the same thing. And after they cleaned up their vomit, he made them put the sweatshirts back on. And I was oh. like, oh, God. I was thinking I was going to lose my lunch seeing what was happening. And the smell, oh, the people started fainting. And no neck had no kindness in his heart. He was kicking them and telling them, get out, get out, you, get out. Get out. And he didn't mean just get out for the day. They were gone for the whole academy. This was the very first day of the academy. And he recognized me from when I swam at college. I did the butterfly. And I was so screwed when I saw the Mason remembered me. And he showed up at my college trying to do recruiting. And we lost six people that night. This was no joke. And if you couldn't make it through PT class, you were gone. This was on the very first week of the class in PT, losing two or three people a day. Friday was test day. By then, 40 to 45 questions were given to us, and if you didn't know them by heart, you couldn't guess the answer. You had to have as many right as you could. After the test, we re returned to the room, and several more people were gone. Friday night was the physical test. Several more were gone that night. What I had... What in the world had I gotten myself into? I was so glad I kept my day job as a meat processor. If I had failed any part, I'd be out of this class by now. So now I'm going to have some musical accompaniment in between. <laughs> Um, we, we could have some of our people meditate in between to relax <laughs> after the <laughs> series. It's just, we've got a lot of people here. Marianne is a nurse. We've got uh, Elaine. We've got nurses here. We can help with if anything gets goes awry. Are any of us going to get kicked out from listening to this? <laughs> <laughs> no no we'll push-ups push or something? <laughs> no. No push-ups. No, no one are needed. You're, you're fine. You're all in good fit health. Living and loving Silver City. Can't beat it, right? Okay, the next story is called Parking Tickets Killed Wife. So my husband, dressed in his uniform at this time, he's already working, he made it through all the tests, and he was assigned to Square Corner. The Square Corner was right in the center of downtown historic Frederick, not far where Barbara Fritchie waved the flag and said, hair not, fear not, harm not my gray hair, or whatever she said in downtown Frederick, Maryland, and it's also where Francis got he made the national anthem. Right? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. You would be the historian, Lucy. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so in this, he was assigned to write parking tickets in the large sitting parking lot behind the bank in downtown Frederick, Maryland. One day, I was writing the tickets, and it expired meter when a man started rushing towards me red in the face very angry the man started screaming flowing the pack ticket in front of my face and saying my wife died because of these tickets and i was like well, how do you die because of a tra traffic ticket and the male continued to yell about the parking tickets that his wife received so this is what happened i just got really quick on the draw and i said Excuse me, sir, you just don't understand. If I write three more tickets, I get a free TV. And then he walked <laughs> off. <laughs> That's a new officer with an attitude, wouldn't you say? <laughs> it's just starting his, his patrol after going through the academy. Okay, the next one 
I'm gonna have a moment to process it. <laughs> Thank you. This next one is called The Legend of Betty Wells. Now, if any of you like the psychic and esoteric, Betty Wells would read your palm and tell you things that you couldn't believe that anybody else would know except for her. Your darkest secrets and your future secrets, she could tell you. Betty Wells was a well-recognized psychic who lived on Route 40, which was the main drag of downtown Silver all the way into the country. And she was in this area between Frederick, Maryland and Hagerstown, Maryland. And you would have to get there to her, res her residence really, really early in the morning, like four or five in the morning. Some people got there at two in the morning because they came from out of town and they'd wait and wait and wait. Well, every time I went past, there were at least 15 cars. And so I decided, what the heck? So I would just drive to Hagerstown and get my little donuts that he got at the Millbrook place and thought nothing of it. But my wife, however, she loved the psychic stuff. And she kept saying, you have to go see Betty. I'm just so curious for what she has to say to you. Yeah. And he said, you know, maybe my next lifetime I'll go. He had no interest in it. So most of Betty's claim to fame was when people would ask about their future. Like, when will I die? Or, and those kinds of questions. And she told them that they needed to leave right now. One rumor was after telling a person to leave, they died in a vehicle accident about an hour later. Betty, Betty would never tell people when it was their time to die. So one day when I was driving to Hagerstown, going to the Millbrook outlet, because he loved donuts. Oh, a cop, oh no, not just cops love donuts. Those were the best donuts. And drove past Betty's place. I saw one car in the parking lot, just one, and I normally see tons. So I figured, what the fuss about? What the fuss about with this lady? I gotta find out. About five minutes passed, and the person in front of me just left. Whoa! I walked into that small building, and there was Betty. She was a good-sized woman with a bun in her hair, and I sat down next to the table, and she told me to place my hands out and face her. So Betty always started off with a prayer. She was a very prayerful woman. She had tons of little nieces and nephews, and her whole family lived around the house that she worked out of. And so, as was the thing in my mind, is the table going to start moving? Well, that didn't happen. But Betty started off first by saying, "You know what? You don't, you don't chase tail." And uh, I really didn't understand that expression because I had just moved to Maryland and I didn't know all the Maryland phrases. And then she said, you're devoted to your wife. You do not like the people you're working for. <laughs> and so far, he she was spot on to what he thought was true. And then Betty said, you will have three children and one will not live. And your wife, by the way, she's pregnant now. If you don't know, let me tell you, she's pregnant <laughs> now. And that would be the next statement that said there would be another child that you will have to make a life making excuse me a life making decision now this was getting scary as my wife had just started kind of getting a little pushy and i just thought she was eating too many donuts but she actually um was on the way for her first job so then betty said i would see you wearing a brown uniform with stripes on it and I was thinking, no way, no way. I was not going to work for the sheriff's department. I was working for Frederick City Police Department. And Betty went on to say things, and she, and then she said that this was all for now. So I put a donation in a jar table, and then I exited. Now the brown uniform would be the sheriff's department, and so. Anyways, he had that in the back of his mind. And then when he went home, I told my wife what Betty had said, except for the part about losing babies. And then we did find out later that um, Betty and I both are people who say things straight out. Because many of the things, well, you will find out what happened as this book continues. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> All right. This one, I think we can relate to. Every city in America can relate to this story. Thanksgiving Day. The county jail would serve turkey with all the fixings on Thanksgiving Day. The day before Thanksgiving, all the local people that preferred drinking got arrested. And they would sit on the lawns or leave a store, would not leave a store so they could get arrested for trespassing. If a person was to leave and in front of a no trespassing sign, the maximum would be up to 60 days in jail for the offense. That's a score for someone who wants to go in because every year they would be caught for trespassing before Thanksgiving. They could be arrested and the local drunks would have a place to eat. They'd have three cots and a cot and Thanksgiving dinner. This was a big tradition in Frederick City, and it happened every single year. <laughs> uh, I always thought that was really interesting because one of my husband's favorite criminal wasn't even a criminal. He was a gentleman named um, Albert Blank, and he for years was a dedicated um, clothing dry cleaning gentleman and he had several different buildings and departments and he was really a good guy and then just one day he just lost it and then he would sit on the corner with his rose something rose uh, it's all wrapped up in a what's it called Four roses. one one of those kind of sort of wrapped up in a little brown bag he was drinking that rose drink and uh, jeff was looking for hey Hey, Albert, did you see where that guy just ran from the bank? He goes, it was over there. <laughs> and he always could tell Barney where to go. And so Jeff, every year, he, um, his real name was Jeff, Jeff Bartlett, or Jeffrey Bartlett, but we all called him Barty. Every year, he would always buy him another one of those rose liquors. I don't remember what it's called. And don't you know when my dad comes to visit, Jeff takes him around town. He only introduced introduced him to one person. And when my husband came home, my dad came home with my husband. He said, "Oh, guess who I met? Albert Blank." <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, to a cop, that's a very valued uh, person, and he really respected him. Okay, so now we're going to go over to and that story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this story is named, I Wanted to Kill Somebody. One early morning, I was talking to Officer Brandon about a case. And in the meeting, we were near Color Lake. Color Lake was a small pond in the middle of the city. It kind of looked like Europe. It looked very German. The whole area downtown Frederick was very German descendants and beautiful buildings. And the lake was just like when you went to your, Germany, you always see beautiful lakes and beautiful ducks and everything. So a call came out at 1.13 in the morning, breaking and entering in progress on Biggs Avenue. Homeowner was fighting with a suspect. Both of us looked at each other as that we were only two blocks away from the call. We arrived within 45 seconds of the call and busted through the door. It was dark, but we could see a person leaning over another person on the floor. We both charged the person when Brandon slipped on the floor, I tackled the guy who had the knife and we both slid on the floor. Whoops, I felt three of my ribs crack on my right side. My adrenaline was going 100 miles per hour at the time. I didn't feel it, it was it, it, right away. I couldn't even feel it, I was numb. The daughter who lived above the building turned on the lights and we saw this poor guy bleeding to death with blood all over the wooden floor. And that's why Brandon slipped on the puddles of blood on the floor. Well, the cavalry had not arrived to assist yet. The ambulance was called. The victim was that was on the floor was Dawson. And he was 43 years old and he had lived on the first floor underneath his where his, sister, his daughter lived. He was flown to Baltimore shock trauma and he was beaten in the head and stabbed 11 times. The suspect, Leon, was 21 years old and worked at Fort Detrick. Now this word, I'm gonna have to ask, how do you pronounce it? D-E-C 
R Y P T O R. The nurses here know. Jakarta. <laughs> For Dietrich, they did all the investigate uh, making um, poisonous things and um, uh -huh. all that. And anyways, he worked there doing vaccine making and all that at Fort Detrick. Mm -hmm. He was given his rights and was transported to headquarters. During the ride to the headquarters, Leon leaned towards me on the front of the car. Do you know why? Do you know why I did it? And just uh, right, Barty's raising his shoulder says, I don't know. He goes, I wanted to kill somebody. I wanted to know how it felt. And I was thinking, okay, maybe that explains Jakarta, isn't that when they start cutting things into the skin and getting samples of skin? But anyways, Leon went on to say he broke into the house and he wanted to steal Dawson's wallet. So he did. And while he was leaving, he noticed there were knives on this little butcher box kind of thing. And he, he took out a rolling pin and the largest knife. Ugh. And then he stood there and he went back and he tried to kill Dawson. The Frederick News Post had the event on the front page of the paper. And in the article, it was quoted, I wanted to kill somebody. I wanted to find out how it felt. The paper had the details of the incident that the victim's life was saved by quick response by the two officers. Ten months later, it took ten months for Leon to be convicted for attempted murder and burglary. The judge gave him 40 years because he had shown no remorse for what he did. Dawson wrote a letter to the chief about how we handled the incident. Brandon and I received a letter of accommodation for our actions. So my question to all of you, including in TV land, does that seem right that someone would get 40 years and didn't kill somebody and those people that kill people don't, I don't get that. Do you get it? <laughs> Sorry. That's how it's... The attempt of murder is just simply a, they didn't get to do what they wanted. Yes, but I mean, would they have to spend 40 years? That sounds like a lot. But anyway. Yes, we have to talk to those lawyers and judges. Okay, this one is about... Uh, a local person that used to call Barty New York. They thought his accent was very interesting because he's from upstate New York, so they call him New York. And they would all brag about each other. Hey, did you get arrested by him? New York. They all want to get arrested by New York. So anyways, this woman, she lived a block away from the station, and she showed up one day, and it went like this. It was the first week of the new headquarters, and I was working the front desk. And all of a sudden, Officer Nolan comes in and says, hey, there's someone that wants to talk to you. She says, where's New York? And he goes, oh, that's me. And so she goes like this, hey, I got a crime to report to you. He goes, you do? What is it? Someone got stabbed. He said, who? Where? And she goes like this. Whoosh, and there's this knife sticking out of her chest. <laughs> and he goes, this is not Halloween. What are you doing? She goes, no, this is real. Alice stabbed me. He was mad at me today. He goes, why the heck did you walk a whole block to come here? Well, I figured you were working. Well, they called the ambulance, got her taken care of, and less than a couple of days later, a little woman named Bella that was telling the story made a call, and they had to get over to her house. Nolan said, okay, we're at the 100 block of All Saints Street. And Bella just walked over from that place and called the ambulance. They got her settled. But then this five days later, I'm sorry, it's a wrong time frame. Five days later, Officer Kyle and I were to Bella and Alice's place for a domestic. I went in and found Alice with burned on all the top of his head and side of his face. We called the ambulance to assist Alice with medical. Bella said, in a proud voice, I poured lighter fluid on his hair when Alice was sleeping. <laughs> now, Alice, prior to that, always had a great big Afro hairstyle that was really cool. And Bella made a forever big mess of Alice's hair that used to be like this and now is like this. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder 
these are our neighbors. These are people from all over the world that have things like this going on. You don't know until you read a book like this. So it is actually helping us all be a little bit safer and more cautious, you think? <laughs> 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 okay, Ham on the Road. I was dispatched. A 1050 PI, which is an auto accident with injury, at the intersection of Old Camp Road and West Patrick Street, which was Route 40. This is about everything in Route 40, you went all the way across Frederick. So if you want to get anywhere, you started through Route 40. And it was near the city limits by the mall. I arrived at the scene and observed a white colored vehicle facing Old Camp Road. There was blood all over the hood and windshield on the windshield on the vehicle with the white burst going back and forth, back and forth. And I could see a female sitting behind the wheel, just staring straight ahead. I then noticed a male on the ground next to a nice Honda Gold Wing motorcycle laying on the shoulder of Route 40. I approached the male and noticed what appeared to be a piece of ham in the lane next to the motorcycle. I placed a trauma pad on the male's lower left, I'm sorry, lower right leg area until the medics came and the ambulance arrived. The first a medic arrived, looked at the male's injury and grabbed what I thought was a piece of ham and placed it on the lower leg of the motorcyclist. The piece of ham was the male's calf muscle blown off from the impact and the that blew that flew the motorcycle rider they then took the motorcycle rider to Baltimore Shark Trauma where they were able to somewhat save his leg. Investigation found the motorcycle was going west on Route 40 and the female in the white vehicle was turning onto Camp Road and never even saw the motorcyclist. The white vehicle struck the motorcycle's right leg at full impact, causing his leg to explode. That's why the white vehicle was covered with blood. And the woman that was sa was seating in her vehicle with the wipers going, you can imagine she was totally in shock. She was totally in shock. So they had to take her and help her too. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Nobody died in that one. Then. That was a good thing. I love how our human body can heal that. Amazing. You know, lose something, it's on the road. Oh, no problem. We'll wash it up and we'll help you. That's a miracle to me. Mm -hmm. It'll go back and it'll be okay. Um, there's one story I want to tell that's, that's too long to tell, but I just want to tell you it was so traumatic at Christmas time. And um, my husband was working late and he came home and he told me the story. I said, that is not true. You're making it up because he always used to joke with me and I totally believed him. He said, at the traffic area, there was a mall and there were roads going to the mall and everybody was racing to get their last presents and gifts for their kids and everything. And right in the center was one of those um I don't know what those cars are that kind of look like half truck and half car in those days in the 60s and 70s. And, and so um, the car smashed and this car made this car, this this part came slicing out and went zoom, boom. And there was somebody's head in the middle of the intersection by the um, mall. And everybody just kept right past it. I could get my presents. I could get my presents. I'm thinking, how do you do that? How can you do that? You know, they just weren't paying attention. They were, they probably were blinded to that. It was a real head in the middle of the street. So when the ambulance comes, you know, I love people that are helping because they think differently than most of us. And he gently lifted up the head and he put the head back on and he put a little brace around it. And then when Jeff was in the body was in the hospital, the hospital the, the doctor so straightforward he goes, Who the heck put this on? Do they think it's gonna grow back? And Barney goes, Well it is Christmas, you know, there are things with <laughs> miracles. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Oh, God. I thought I thought that story cannot be true. Would you really be very surprised? To go to, I can't imagine people doing that. Okay. Here we go. We're on to another story. This one is called, oh, this one's a long one. It's it's about a new baby. Um, if you want a long one, if you want to start with a short one. A short one? Short one? We'll go with a short one. Good. Okay, this is a, a gentleman's quarterly story. My husband loved joking with all his female officers. He had, was so close to so many of the female officers, and they saw him more than I did. And so I loved him all. I said, thank you for taking care of my party. So one day, Officer Adriana was looking at a magazine in the dispatch room and exclaiming, look at this guy. He is so gorgeous. Look at this guy. I told her the name of the guy on the cover of GQ magazine was Tim Dunn. And she goes, yeah, like, you know his name. And Adriana asked back in a different name, like, oh, no, 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 that's not his name. He goes, yeah, that's his name. That's my wife's brother. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And he said, no, she, he just changed his name to be a, a model. And she said, yeah, right, yeah, right. And and my husband said, no, look look at his cheekbones. He has high cheekbones and little eyes like my wife. That is my wife's brother. She didn't believe me. She said, come over next Tuesday at 7 o'clock and you can meet him. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So she came over that night and she opened the door and she said, well, where is he? Where is he? And she goes, I don't know. You have to find him. So here's my brother sitting. He was visiting from upstate New York in Maryland to visit us that weekend. Jeff had so much fun because she was like walking around like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I said, he's the friendliest guy on the whole planet, you know? So she had fun talking to him and she realized Jeff wasn't teasing her that time. It was real. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And um, um, the interesting thing too is you know, this is in the days long before it was okay to be male, female, be with men, be with women. It didn't really matter. It was just this person is no longer on the planet, but he definitely was so loving. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. All righty. Now we're going on to, um, I don't know if you want to. I don't know if we want this one or not. Let's see what mood we're in now. Um, a fast, fast one, Big Ben. This is when Jeff was starting to get really tired of being a police officer. It was like so much battle with all the different ones in charge that were trying to tell him to change his report, change his investigation, go in court and lie. And he said, I will never tell a lie. And when he did all his officer training, he would tell the people first thing, if you're going to work with me and I'm going to be your field training officer, you're going to follow the field training guide that I wrote and you're going to find out the first rule is always tell the truth. Because if you always tell the truth, you don't have to have a very super good mo a memory. But if you lie, you, you don't always remember what you told a lie about. And once you have been told been heard that you tell lies on the not the deck. When you're in the being at the courthouse and the stand. The, the stand, thank you. When you're at the stand, you better not lie. And so he started getting in little wars with all his leaders because he didn't want to tell a lie. So anyways, he was starting to get like, oh, I think I'm gonna go to a different department instead of the city. I think I'm gonna go to the sheriff's department with the brown uniform that Betty talked about earlier. <laughs> So he was walking the square during that evening shift, and I was, I was just uh, requesting. I was just again trying to. Okay, what am I saying? <laughs> I should just tell the story instead of trying to read it. He was talking to one of his friends that was with the sheriff's department, and her name was um, doesn't matter, um, Allison. And so this, he was really intent because Allison was the sheriff and he was with the city and he went, didn't want to tell her that he was thinking about moving over there. And it was an intense conversation at night and they're both looking at each other, talking through the window. And this guy comes up and he says, excuse me, what time is it? And my husband rips his head over to the side. Do I look like Big Ben? Go buy yourself a watch. <laughs> I'm thinking you did not say that. He goes... I don't know. Why do people think we have all the answers? <laughs> so then he 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, you. just that the body's sense of humor was really kind of dark. There was this little restaurant in downtown Frederick, Maryland that sold hot dogs with lots of onions and lots of sauce on it. And they were called, they were called Texas Hots. They, were, they had a special name, Red Hots, it, whatever they were, they were terrible smelling. And he would eat them before he had to do walking beat because... Ah, and what he braids on so much. <laughs> he did not have to answer any questions. And he thought that was such a hoot, you know. And then when he'd see one of his officers that were being bad to somebody or mad at somebody or having a night, he would take all his uh, white hots, they were called white hots, the white hots in the bag with the onions and stick them in the car of his friend. And, you know, then the friend's like, what's that smell? What's it smell? He couldn't find out where the smell was. And the radio, what's going on with my car? Has it been washed in a while? And they never found out until they finally cleaned their car. All righty. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to get serious. Are you ready for one? It's called Don't Mess Up the Wall. Okay. And this one is kind of intense for a little while but then you'll get over it okay <laughs> don't mess up the wall one friday afternoon i was dispatched to a family problem in urbana the urbana like the big state of maryland it's not super big you know we've got pennsylvania then we've got maryland and then we've got the dc virginia area and since frederick maryland was like a gateway or uh, the bedroom community for Washington, D.C. people. So some of these people, they would come two hours down to Washington in the morning and two hours back, and it was just like really a lot of traffic. When we first got there in the early 80s, there were like two, three lanes, and then two or three lanes, and then it doubled six lanes on this side, six lanes on this side, and then it was like eight lanes on this side, eight lanes on that side. And since Jeff was an accident reconstructionist, he would have to count sometimes how many are going per minute. And it was just unbelievable. So Urbana was like where more people started moving to because it was further away from the main drive from Frederick to Washington, D.C. So people thought it was a good place to live. It was more country. So one Friday night, I was dispatched to a family problem in Urbana. A distraught female started stated that her son was breaking up stuff. He had locked the door on himself in the room, and he would not come out. With both of us standing outside the bedroom door, the mother pleaded with her son to please, please open the door. And while we were waiting for backups to arrive, the mother instructed me to please knock down the door. Please knock down the door. And I asked if, um, if I, um, are you sure? Are you okay? Um, how old is this kid? She said, 15. Okay. You're worried about your son. You're worried about his protection. Okay. He broke down the door of the room and he found the young male sitting in the bed with a gunshot to the inside of his mouth. A shotgun, not a gunshot. <laughs> I said that wrong. A shotgun is real long, right? A regular gun would be like this, but a shotgun, how do you have that to your mouth? I don't know. Anyways, he had his finger on the trigger. Can you do that okay with a shotgun? It seems like it'd be... Anyway, I'm picturing it funny, but so I notified dispatch of the situation. The boy told me he was going to shoot himself as the mom took off running down the hallway screaming. Oh, it was shocking to open a door and see someone with a shotgun in their mouth. I was quickly trying to figure out what to say and noticed that the boy was against this really nice, really nice wooden shelf. And I was about 10 feet from the boy, and I said, you know what? If you shoot yourself, you're really going to mess up that nice shelf, and your blood's going to get all over it. And in that moment, I guess that pissed off the boy. And he took the shotgun out of his mouth, and he put it towards me, and I grabbed it. And I handcuffed him and waited for my backup to arrive. He was transported to the hospital for a emergency evaluation. Law enforcement can file a mandatory emergency evaluation if someone is trying to harm themselves. The hospital then would be required to have two doctors evaluate the person, often necessitating admission 
or psychiatric lockdown. So that's going to be a sad one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But it was a good one because someone was bold enough to say the weirdest thing to get the kid ticked and saved his life. Okay. Mm. This next one is a ghost whisper one. And I would like to do a little preamble because we're almost finished with the stories that I'll be reading because you don't want all 300 in one time. I know you told me that earlier. <laughs> so we'll hold off on that. So the ghost whisper stuff goes way back because this book just is going when he first started his academy career until the very last day where this is really intense experience happens that makes him just say, I can do no more. After 24 years or 25 years of it, he just realized he could do no more. And it's really intriguing because it's tied up with information that comes back to him when we left Maryland and he retired here. And he said, let's go to Tucson. So we went to Tucson and he kept wanting me to go to see the psychic there. At Tucson, I said, I don't need to see a psychic. No, see the psychic. Why can't I say that word? See the psychic. I need you to see the psychic. So I said, okay. I, I sat with her for about 15 minutes. And her name was Mary Catherine, a very good Catholic girl. And I was Catholic. So I said, okay. She read something to me and it wasn't that significant. But then the next day, let's go find Catherine. Let's go find Mary Catherine. Why? Why? Well, it actually ties into the exact reason why he left being a cop. And this psychic told every detail of it. And I'll just give you one hint of it if you're reading the story. She says straight out to him, why are my hands on fire? She doesn't say hi to him. She doesn't introduce herself. She just says, why are my hands on fire? You tell me. And so he just waits for her to tell. And then she starts telling, telling. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. So when you read the story at the end, you'll know how it all ties together. Anyways, it was really amazing because he let me work with him after that to help clear all the ghost whispering stuff that had been happening to him because all the people that died, one year, 40 people died on the accident reconstruction stuff. Another one, 70 people died. And, you know, they saw him. He was the last face before they went. So he was also called the angel of death. He was also called body bag Barty. He was called deputy death. He was called all sorts of names. So this ghost whisperer story is fairly short, but I love this one because it's really very telling. Uh, the call came in from dispatch and he was always in the farthest away place from anybody else. But that's when the accidents would happen. Where, where he was the farthest away, he always attracts something to be right there at the right time to help something. So he gets called. Two teenagers were drinking and driving near Camp David in the woods of Camp David, which was real close to our home. And so Jeff heard one was with that. Um, oh, what is the guy called? This so you can tell me that. The, the people that are running the ambulance, they're called the, the medics. Is that, or, or what else? Or paramedics. paramedics. The paramedics. One is with the paramedic, and the other um, is going to the hospital. So when he pulls up, it's dark, and he's got his lights on, and there's a stoop no bigger than, you know, knee high, and the guy is sitting on a bump of a tree, blonde hair, black and red shirt, and denim jeans, and sneakers. And he goes, officer. And so... I'm already walks towards him. Yes, son. Um, it wasn't me driving. It wasn't me driving. And, you know, he's just like, that's weird. I thought, and then he, he goes, my friend over there is with the paramedic. He was driving. And he goes, okay, thanks for, and he's looking back and where'd the kid go in the dark? You know, that fast it disappeared. So he walked over and he talked to the friend. So, son, what's going on? I wasn't driving, officer. It was my friend, you know. He said, okay, well, I'll reconstruct the accident, and I'll let you know, and we'll talk about this. So about an hour after everything was finished with the accident reconstruction, in the dark, with his lights, in the middle of the forest of Camp David, he got called, Barty, you need to come to the morgue. So he'd go to the morgue, bottom of the hospital, went in, and there is that blonde dude, blonde hair, black and white plaid shirt, denim, and sneakers. So that spirit stuck around because he did not want 
the death on his soul before he left his body. And so the next day, my husband goes knocking on the kid's door that was with the paramedic. Now, family opens the door and says, can I please speak to your son? So they let this, him go up the stairs to the son. And, okay, son, have you told your parents yet? The kid starts crying and crying. No, I can't. I can't tell them. He said, listen, I'm not going to tell you to do anything. I'm just going to let you know. If you choose not to say anything, you're going to be haunted for the rest of your life. He goes, will you go with me? And, and this is so not like my husband. And so the teenage dude held my husband's hand. They walked down the stairs and just stood there. My buddy just stood there silently while the, the, the kid said, will you please stay here while I'm talking? And he told the story. And so it was so such a big clearing because then Jeff Barty could go to the other family and say, it wasn't your son's fault. Your son was not drinking. He was not driving. And I'm sorry to give this report to you, but they were totally relieved. So that's, wow. that was the most ghost whisper story that I remember best of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. But see, Jeff had ghost whispering. A lot of officers have ghost whispering. A lot of medic people have ghost whispering. A lot of nurses and doctors have it. And so it's not a unique gift, but um, Jeff was always hearing spirits talking to him. When he was 16, his friend's grandmother died. And it was 2.02 2 in the morning he woke up because the window was clacking with those little um, mini blinds. And the window wasn't even open. It was just clacking against it as if the wind was blowing. So he looked over and there floating above his bed was his best friend's grandmother. And he thought, whoa, what are you doing here? And she was in this white ground floating above his bed. And so he went to sleep, remembering that number of the clock. And sure enough, his friend called the next morning. And he said, hey, I'm sorry, my and Jeff goes, did your grandmother die? And he goes, the friend said the exact same time that Jeff said at the exact same time. So we all have these gifts, right? So anyways, that is perfect timing for questions, feedback. Um, if you want more stories, of course, I have about 290 more left. <laughs> um, there, I mean, there's so many cool ones in there, like the tornado one, where I don't know how he survived that. The vehicle was, and he didn't remember a thing. Yes. I would like you to tell the story of the anniversary. Oh, the anniversary. the anniversary. Okay, the anniversary. Do you want me to read it? Actually, you, you want to read it? You're you a better tell. reader than I am. Why don't you come read it? No. Just, just to solve it. It was just the most fun thing I was reading the book. Like, wow. Okay, anniversary. Who wants that, to? That, that, that really makes you understand how crazy she is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> or how crazy he is to marry me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to find out where it no, is. I'll tell another one real quick. and that, they, they can read that when they have the book. Okay. Uh, when you had moved and the girls didn't know yet that they were each going to have their own bedroom. Yes. And, and so they're coming in at night and they're tired and they're half asleep and whatever. And they get put in their beds and they wake up in the morning and they find out they each have their own bedroom. And their mom was so smart, she gave them walkie-talkies so they can talk to each other. And I just went, oh, my God, what a crazy mother. <laughs> lucky girls, lucky girls. <laughs> oh, gosh. That, that's, a good, that's a good thing. I did want someone to read that story because, you know what? Oh, it is, it is an interesting story. But I, if I... Just tell it. And I'm I'm thinking there's one other story you were gonna say that you really liked. But I never found that one in the book. That one in which one? Yeah, it was it was the one that there was um Barney is always further away than anybody else and he gets there before they do and whatever. And this guy was his his family was outside and the guy was threatening he was gonna commit suicide down in the basement. And so the two cops get together, Barty and the other one, and and you know, and the, the wife goes, Well, go through the kitchen and go this way to go down the stairs, and he's down there. And so, you know, they go in and and Barty's looking at all this beautiful wood going down into the thing, and he's going, Wow, 
these trees and how well this was done. It was polished. You know, people, the guys that really like the wood and they got these slabs. And the so he's walking down there and he looks to the other guy and he sees the other one there with, you know, he's ready to shoot himself with his shotgun and stuff. And he goes, what? You're doing this guy just drops the gun. He says, You're gonna blood, you're blood, and your stuff's gonna be all over that wood ruining you. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, Okay, yeah, if Barbie's just as crazy as Mary, so they get a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you that the um, the, the book purposely didn't have a table of contents because some you know how the table of contents has the page number. But some of them were such short stories that had the same page number several times. And so that's why it doesn't have the pages on it. But I'll tell you really briefly the um, anniversary story because a lot of times, you know, women want to celebrate their men in their life and they want to celebrate for children and they want to celebrate. In fact, a friend of mine, Peg, always would say, if it wasn't for women, there wouldn't be any holidays because Women want to uplift people and have celebrations all the time. So when you're when you've got someone that's a cop and he's got so much blood and gut stuff and comes home at night and you're like, why do I feel like I want to kill myself? Yes, you're right. I had two suicides. You're so close to that guy. You're getting downloads of what's going on in his life, even if you're not knowing what's going on. And um, so I wanted to think of something fun for him. It was going to be our 16th anniversary. And so I got my um, sister to send my wedding dress, which was my mom's wedding dress, and I got it all fixed up. And then um, Jeff, I said, why don't you put on your tuxedo just for the fun of it? We'll go out to dinner. And so my daughters fixed me up with the little wedding outfit on. And then all of a sudden, this big limo shows up. And Barty's like, oh, it's May. That's right. There's the prom. Oh, the school's that way. And he goes, no, I'm supposed to be here. I'm sending this to Bartlett's house. Yeah. So. They're saying, why is there a limo here? I said, well, you've never been in a limo, have you? No. And it was a stretch limo. It was about as big as this room. And he goes, why are you in a wedding dress? I said, oh, we're just for fun. You know, I love getting dressed up. Anyways, so we both got in. I said, well, let's let the girls come for a ride with us. No, no we don't. Come on. Let's. And then my friend Susan Chapman pulls up. I said, Susan, you want to go for a ride? So we jump in the car and we all go for a ride. And just like, this is weird, you know? So we're driving through the country in Woodsboro, Maryland. And there's my friend. Hey, my friend's going to <laughs> stop and say hi to my friend. And so she's just like, no, no. I said, come on, just take a minute. So we all get out. And then my friend stops my lawn and takes pictures for us. Oh, <laughs> that was great, you know? Drove the girls home, let them out of the car, let Susan out of the car. And then we went on our way for our ride. So we were going to go to dinner, and then when we get to the dinner, it was a historic place in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And so when they when they open the door, these people arrive with plates of food. He goes, wow, this is so nice, and they're serving us in the limo. He goes, oh, and he goes, well, well, why don't you just keep driving? So the guy kept driving the limo, and Jeff's eating. He goes, oh, this looks just like our cell work. Just kept eating, and this is really good. I like it. Oh, it looks like our plates, too. Isn't that interesting? And we went to the Devil's Den, which was in Gettysburg area. Now, in Gettysburg, the Devil's Den is where so many Americans were killed, you know, and he knew all everything about history, and he'd play these Gettysburg games, and anything strategic playing that's what he spent his whole childhood because his parents broke up when he was really young, domestic violence issues. So at two and three years old, he'd be alone a lot. He'd be with babysitters a lot. And when he was older, he just had board games. So he was in hog heaven to be in devil's den eating dinner, you know? <laughs> and then he thought we we're going to go home. Well, isn't it time to go home? Oh, no, Susan can stay longer. She won't watch the kids. They're, they're, they're old enough. So I said, why don't we just go see? There's a cool schoolhouse. I want to show you a history, historic schoolhouse. So the guy drives us in the limo all the way to the schoolhouse, and we get out, and I said, let's go look inside. No, no, I don't need to look inside. Come on, let's go look inside. Oh, it's a hotel. Oh, it's a, they, look, look at this. Hey, let's go see if there's a room for the, in the principal's office. So they gave us a room in the principal's office, and Jeff goes, we can't stay here. We, our daughters are home alone. I said, no, I'll have to Susan stay later. So we get in there, and all of a sudden, he's like, I don't have my, I, Google stuff for my um, 
I, what is it called? Daily solution. Daily solution for the contacts. contacts. Thank you. Contacts. So he's looking through the, the bathroom and he finds his contacts, his thing. He goes, oh my God, it's the same kind I use. I'm like, okay, he's still not getting it. And then he goes and he goes, I have nothing to wear. I said, Jeff, look around. So then he found his suitcase and he found everything he couldn't find last week and didn't know why he couldn't find it. And the next morning he goes, oh, how are we going to get home? The, 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 gosh, the limbo guy is gone. I said, you are not a very good investigator. Couldn't you see our car was parked right in front of the hotel? <laughs> he couldn't even see it. He, he just was so burned out and so exhausted that he really, really needed that time away. So he just never forgot that 16th anniversary and all of the little things that I did to kind of, make him laugh afterwards because like how many people would have the same plates you know in the same works <laughs> no he didn't get that <laughs> so it was fun and teasing each other about it. thank you for telling me oh thank you for asking and i i totally want you all to know that this wd death is a cool book for so many people I'm just gifting it to people because I just want it out there for people to enjoy and to realize we really have a challenging world and we need these officers and firefighters and all these helping people, nurses, doctors to help us because we have no idea what's really happening out there except for the people that are where the road meets the rubber or wherever that expression is saving us and protecting us every day. And so I thank you all for listening to these stories. And if you have questions, I'd love to hear them. If you have any insights, I'm up for it. Okay. Anyone on Zoom, anyone in the room, anyone that's going to be watching it in the future on YouTube when it gets set up that way? Yes. How did you meet and what age were you when you got married? Okay. I met Jeff by accident when I was a sophomore in high school and it was a three second event i was getting off my bus with my mercy uniform on blue jumper white shirt and i look over and i see this nice looking guy on a bicycle and i just noticed him but that's all i didn't remember a month later when years later when i was in high school and senior year i was saving up money to go to europe and i was working at pizza hut and in he walks and i'm thinking why do you look familiar he goes well I saw you a number of years ago. You were coming off a bus. And I said to myself, that's a girl I'm going to marry. I said, yeah, right. And and so he kept coming to the Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut, every time he would go scuba diving with his friend. And I didn't think anything of him. He just was like a, I'm sorry, dorky kind of guy, you know. <laughs> he was. He had nice hair. It was always in perfect place. And mine's always sticking up everywhere. So I was always impressed with his hair. His hair was always perfect. And then uh, it took months and months and months. He kept coming and coming, leaving big tips. And then he started mocking my boots. What's with the boots? Because at Mercy High School, you wore old um, hiking boots and old um, boys' boots. That's what we did because we couldn't wear anything new. We always had to wear a uniform, but you could do anything you want with your shoes. So anyway, um, he started calling and he said, well, why don't we go out? I said, I don't even know you. He goes, well, I'm afraid to go out with you because your dad was my industrial arts teacher. So I saw what your dad did and I don't want to, I don't, I don't know if I want to date you. I said, that's okay. We don't have to date. I said, what happened? He said, he was in the industrial arts room with my dad, who was a stellar teacher, but he was really strict. And so this guy, Danny DeRosa kept doing this, doing this with a lathe machine and my dad said stop doing that you're gonna rip your finger off stop turning it on and off you're gonna rip your finger off if you do it again i'm gonna hit put your hands in a vice and whack you with a two by four <laughs> and so all these seventh and eighth grade boys are like mr dunn will go do that mr dunn could really do that so it turned out that danny does it again with the lathe and so come here danny Go like this, like you're praying. Now, this was an Italian town, and everybody was praying. <laughs> this is like it, like the Italians. Always, we were always praying in, in our town. And he said to one of the boys, get me a two-by-four. Got a two-by-four. Got another guy to come over and tighten it up for me. Okay, whack him. <laughs> one of the kids whack him. And my, my, my party, my job that I didn't even know very well, 
was scared to death of Mr. Dunn. He wasn't going to ask me out. So that's how it all started. <laughs> I was just a senior in high school. And, I, and then years later, he wanted to marry me. I said, I don't want to get married yet. I want to go to Europe. I want to finish my college. I want to get my master's degree. No, no, you can do all those things. I said, well, I have a whole bunch of friends that are guys. I don't want to leave any of my guy friends around. I said, why do we have to give up 50% of the population just to get married? And so he goes, you're right. Yeah, you can still have all your guy friends. So we've had a really, we had a good 42 years together. A lot of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, if you ever liked Homicide Life on the Street, he was in some of those episodes as an extra, and he was such a hoot. He's only in there for like three seconds, <laughs> but it was in Baltimore, Maryland. It was close by. So, any other questions? Your kid yeah. shared a yeah. comment with you. On oh, screen. okay. What does it say? Can you read it to me? It says, love you, Mom. Great job sharing dad's stories. Oh, my gosh. It's my daughter in Australia. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, Caitlin's favorite story that she sent to this book to be made. It was called Bad Boys, Bad Boys. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they call for you? So my daughters were seven and eight and they were sitting on the floor watching TV and on comes that TV show and then they start screaming, Mom, Mom, Dad's on TV. I said, yeah, yeah. So I went in there and sure enough there was my husband on TV taking out the bad guy's stuff from his pockets and arresting him. And then the next day in school, they all they heard all day long was, bad girls, bad girls, what you going to do? What you going to do when your dad comes for you? <laughs> so they they have so many take-home car stories that, were, that are in here, that are woven in here. Mm -hmm. So anything else? Anything else? What do you think, Roberto? Any stories that stood out for you? Did, did you get to your... Yes, I made it all over Europe, hitchhiked around with girlfriends, and then I went back. Caitlin from Australia, she kept reading all my journals from Europe and pictures, and she said, Mom, let's go together. So 30 years later, we went and we hitchhiked around Europe again. I want to go back to Italy. Who wants to go? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> so thank you all for being so excellent at listening and answering my questions when I lose my thought here. <laughs> I just, Mayor, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for doing this. I know what a, what an incredible journey it's been for you. And I think uh, this is a great effort you're doing to let people know what you're doing. Like, thank you. Who you are. Thank you. And, and because you are a death doula, you have been helping so many people cross over. I would be interested if you ask for Jeff to come and visit because he always comes to whoever asks mm -hmm. him. My friend that helped me edit this in Arkansas, Shauna, oh my gosh, she went through hours and hours of editing. And when she finished, oh, she was so upset. A cop was following her down the road in Arkansas. And she was like, oh my God, I didn't get a ticket. I can't afford a ticket. Just <laughs> the cop just kept following her right on her, right on her bumper, right on her bumper. As soon as she screamed out just name, the car went away. <laughs> so I do think those little cards work. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any of you, we can um, put those little eclairs out for you. And if you have questions or comments in the future, just give me a call. Anything else on there? No. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> calling us from Australia. That's so neat. It's interesting. Can she show up on this picture? You can't. Uh, she'd have to turn on her camera and her microphone. Okay. Ask her if she could do that. That'd be interesting. She can hear you. Katie, can you turn on your microphone? And can you? Yeah, I can turn my microphone on. Can we see your face? Can we see your face? Can you see it on the screen? No, I see exactly. No, I see exactly. No. Good job, Mom. Thank you, Cater. Oh, there's Cater. You did a good job. Let people know they can, if they want to get the book, there's a digital version online they can download. Okay, thank you, honey. Okay, thank you, honey. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good job, Mary. Thank you, Mary.